At the end of 2023, the scoreboard was basically that the left took Donald Trump off the ballot in Colorado, and we took Dylan Mulvaney off a beer can. Now, obviously, the ballot thing being permanent was a long shot, but it does illustrate what each side likes to direct their efforts towards what they consider to be a victory, something worth celebrating. And I've heard a lot of sentiment in the last couple of years. It's like, we need to stop focusing on political battles. The culture is what's important. We must fight the culture war. All focus now has to be on the culture. And it's like, okay, well, what does that even mean? What? What does the culture mean to you? And as we find out from listening to these people and seeing what they believe culture is, uh, the right has no idea what culture is, let alone how to make it for themselves, and much less how to actually take the culture back from the left. It's one of those things where I don't even know what these people mean when they are saying these words to me, but culture is not just something that you can force or commission. That's why when the right says, well, the right needs to be making culture. Okay, yeah, go on. Go make some culture. I dare you. Go go off, make culture. It's not that simple. And the reason it's not that simple is because culture is simply what people do naturally. And that's why the culture war actually is so important. Ultimately, it's because it's a war for the soul of the nation, because culture is downstream from the soul of the people making it. It's a reflection of their spirit. It's defined and demonstrated by what people do. And conservatives don't do anything. We also have no understanding of what it means to be right wing, which is why our attempts to make right wing culture tend to fall flat. And it's because our lack of knowledge of ourselves and our world and our connection to our world leads us to sort of caricaturize ourselves and pretend that if we just do something over the top to own the libs, we're triggering the libs, this is somehow culture. And you know, I've often said that if we put up a mural of a mother cradling a child, that would be more right wing than putting a mural of like Ronald Reagan riding a velociraptor shooting an Uzi. Like if you hired a right wing artist uh, to paint a mural on the side of a building in Portland, Oregon, and they painted something like that, or George Washington flexing his biceps on a pile of dead British soldiers, something like that, it would take far longer for that mural to be defaced than it would if the mural were just a mother cradling her child. And we might be confused about that, but the left certainly is not. And it's because they actually have a better understanding understanding of what it means to be right wing than we do. Like they might hate it. They might hate things that are good and natural and true, but they understand that they're right wing. Whereas we think being right wing is just like owning the libs, being smug. That's why the culture that we make is just the left, but based. It's like, we don't know ourselves. We don't know what our culture is, what we are. So because of that, we can only respond to the left. It's not a real right wing. It's simply this like counter leftism, which is why all of our culture is things like beer, but based coffee, but veteran owned and based and made by not a bisexual Antifa member. And it's like, well, maybe I like that. Maybe that's why I pay the $7, whatever. So to actually win, to actually take the culture back, uh, we're going to need to do a lot more than what we have been doing. We're going to have to be serious about it. We're going to have to develop a proper relationship with the ideas that have been fetishized throughout our culture by the modern world. Revolution, democracy, equality, scientism, these are not our friends. These are not our ideas. We need to rediscover and cultivate a proper relationship with natural law, hierarchy, spirituality, liberty, all of these things properly understood would do far more to advance our culture and our cause than whatever else we're talking about right now. And honestly, if it weren't for the woke stuff, I wouldn't actually know how to define or explain what we're doing. If I were just a normal person and it weren't for the Dylan Mulvaney stuff, like I wouldn't even understand what the right is claiming to be about, what it's supposed to look like for the right to declare victory, or even just a victory. Is it all just a grift? What do we actually want our culture to look like? How do we actually get there? I'm so glad that you asked because funny enough, we're actually going to go over what culture actually is, why it's so important, why conservatives can't seem to make it, some problems with the idea of making our own culture, some truths about why our culture has become the way that it is, how we can actually start to take it back, why most of our perceived victories in doing so, particularly with boycotting, things like that, they're exaggerated, they're not really victories, typically they're just trying to fleece money from you, and how these things affected what we saw in 2023, and what that all means going forward, do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. Here we are, just like I said, back precisely when I intended to be. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas and a wonderful New Year celebration. So we're going to go through the big culture war victories from last year in just a second. Uh, but I want to get this out of the way first. Don't get your heart broken. 
don't put too much faith in your generals. They have no idea what they're doing in almost all cases. And for the most part, I'm not going to be, you know, sniping at anyone in particular. I'm not trying to throw shade. Sometimes there are specific instances, but a lot of it is just a general trend. But um, I just have to let you know that ahead of time because people get so excited and so caught up in the hype of all of these things that they will like be personally offended if you poke holes in it because they have allowed themselves to become so emotionally invested into these things and they need them to be real. They need them to be successful to make themselves feel perhaps less anxious about the state of the world and their country and their culture. So I'll just point this out quickly. If conservatives actually understood what culture is, which is probably a prerequisite to being able to take a culture back or produce it effectively, right? If they actually understood it, then they would have far different understandings of what it means to be an American, what our immigration policy should be, et cetera. Because right now, Conservatives seem to basically think that everything will be okay, that you can sustain a nation based on people having the correct opinion on a calendar, on a syrup bottle, on Mr. Potato Head, a sports team, etc. And a lot of people think that we shouldn't even address these things at all. They're just trivial tease. Uh, but I disagree. I think they are actually important. The problem is that the discussion around them doesn't seem to understand what the problem actually is, which is that American culture, American identity – all of this has been completely deconstructed and it's just up for grabs right now. Like if this weren't the case, I can pretty much guarantee you that our culture would look much more like something approximating a right-wing Christian conservative culture than it does now. So I just have to start off by pointing that out because it comes as no surprise to me that the same class of people who thinks that anybody can be an American so long as they do so legally and write down that they want to work hard on a piece of paper, that's also the class of people that says that culture is something that, that can just be commissioned. We can just take the culture back by making better culture. But as we'll discuss, our culture is sick because our people are sick. But okay, what's the problem? When we say we've lost, we're losing in the culture. What does that mean? Our problem is that our culture is backwards and masochistic. It hates itself to the extent that it even exists beyond being an anti-culture where our culture is that we have no culture. It wants to be humiliated and embarrassed and stupid. It's like we said years ago, American cultural exports are essentially gluttony, feminism, and butt stuff. Like that's what we shove into the faces of the rest of the world and say, look, look at what we do. Like this is what is conveyed by the flag of our empire. And these are the more extreme examples. These are the things that really wake people up to how badly we've lost. And we'll discuss the more subtle aspects of this stuff in a minute, but all the really degenerate content, the problem is it's tough to compete with that, which doesn't mean that it's good, just that man's nature is not good. So if your strategy is just to make better content, content that's more attractive to people that they're going to prefer, how are you going to do that? If this person is making music that makes people feel powerful because it's talking about violence and sex and there's a million of them just like that, the instrumentation itself has been produced by a computer that has it down literally to a, a science to entrance people, to hypnotize them, and you make one song about wasting tax dollars. You understand there's sort of an imbalance there. And two, with a lot of what has become our culture, we're at a point now where the attitudes of the consumer are too rotten to be rehabilitated organically. Like they will no longer respond to that treatment because when people are offering perversion and evil, that's the forbidden fruit. That's always gonna be eye-catching. It's always gonna be enticing to people. And you can't actually expect people to reasonably refuse that consumption and indulgence, especially at a large scale. Like some people might refuse it, good for them. But most people will not do that because our nature is imperfect and it's flawed. So the way that our system is now, it's very easy to profit off selling and promoting vice, degeneracy, hedonism, everything like that. And even ignoring all the other factors which do play into this, I'm not optimistic about outcompeting that kind of content to prevent society from killing itself. This kind of degeneracy has been going on at varying scales and to varying extents for thousands of years. And the only thing that actually works in shutting it down, this kind of content, is like literally shutting it down. I mean, this has been done before. We can do it perfectly well here. There is no constitutional, legal, moral, nor historical historical case for people being able to profit off the moral degradation of Americans. And this has to be the path forward, by the way, with the particularly rotten and wicked stuff, because the effort to just make better culture puts too much faith into, one, the ability of people to be rational consumers at a large scale, uh, and two, and perhaps more importantly, our ability to even understand what better culture is, let alone to produce it at a scale which could actually compete for the majority. And also, it assumes that any real threat to the economic and cultural hegemony of the regime would not just be crushed instantly, which it would be. Uh, they don't really care if you want to fleece money from conservatives by selling them like a based beer or something like that. But anything that's actually serious, 
Yeah, they would crack down on that swiftly and harshly. It would disappear overnight. And we've been saying this for years, which is that we have to cut off the ability of evil to influence people from the top down. If it occurs to people at their own volition, hmm, you know, I think I want to go organically pursue vice. There's only so much you can do for them, pray for them. But the way that our culture is now, it is filled with incessant distractions and temptations to where even people who really put serious effort in to avoid stumbling, even they're compelled to indulge in this type of material and self-loathing and masochism. And that's a violation of their sovereignty, actually. Being assaulted by this constant, unrelenting promotion of vice and smut and degeneracy, that is a violation of individual autonomy, and that can't be tolerated. And I have a lot of respect for artists and storytellers. I'm not one of these people who thinks that anybody can do anything that they put their mind to. I do believe in talent and innate ability, but I also believe in the government protecting its people from being harmed, especially for profit and at a mass scale. And our problem gets dressed up in a million different ways to take our attention and our dollars in a million different directions, but it's ultimately the same thing that it's been for decades. We do not have legitimate representation. We do not have legitimate political power, which is to say that our power, our ability to make the world closer to how we would like it to be, to how it was for our parents and for our grandparents, that does not exist in a legitimate capacity. That's a serious conversation. That requires a lot of brain power and discipline and coordination to solve. But it's a lot easier and it's a lot more fun, a lot more profitable to circumvent that discussion into silly things that get a lot of attention on social media. And if we had that power, that doesn't just mean that all of the sudden, everyone who's making culture are just going to be our guys. The people who are good at telling stories would continue to be good at telling stories without them having to be ornamented by woke stuff or perhaps having them be subversive by nature. The same goes for all culture, which is to say that the same way that now there are people who are right wing, who make great successful movies, their path of least resistance into becoming successful in entertainment or whatever, how they pass the loyalty tests for admission is by keeping that to themselves, not setting off any alarms and transgressing against the religious beliefs of the regime. Same goes. When we take the culture back, what that looks like is the same, except now in order to achieve success, you can't be caught dead expressing sentiment or having sympathies to anything that goes against what we want our culture to look like. Doesn't mean that all of a sudden our guys are in charge of making all the culture, but it does mean that we have enough power to direct what that will look like and to a certain extent who those people will be. But again, the guys who we have who are closest to the levers of power are completely incompetent. So we can't really soon expect anything to change uh, under these circumstances. You know, I remember doing some event last fall. I go back to my hotel room, hanging up the suit. I throw on Fox News in the background. Ted Cruz is on there. He's promoting his book about how to beat these people and take the culture back. And he was complaining that the woke Marxists were colluding with the Chinese Communist Party by editing out a Taiwanese flag in their version of Top Gun, but also that the Chinese version of Bohemian Rhapsody omitted the fact that Freddie Mercury was gay. And he said, we have to fight this. Dude, what are you talking about? Who is this for? We have to fight China because they deny the existence of a country which no American can find on a map and because they refuse to, like, what, validate Freddie Mercury as a queer icon? This is your far-right, conservative, pro-American senator from Texas? God help us. The point being, we can discuss the logistics of this at a later time, what it would look like, but until this thinking shifts from where it is now into something with more teeth, don't expect anything to change. And yeah, if you want to get into more detail uh, with that at a later time, let me know. We can do a whole discussion on what that would look like as a matter of policy, personnel, etc. Also, why do you take so much time to do those news hits, to sell those books? Like, do you, do you have that time? Everything else is under control. We can throw it on autopilot. Okay, let's talk about the culture. Because the right has no real cultural presence, as it has no real political presence, because we have no political figures, I mean, guys that are actually big players, guys that represent us, at least until next year, uh, we also have no real cultural figures. So instead, we have this weird hybrid where our biggest thought leaders make themselves into these quasi-celebrities who create grand spectacles for themselves to denigrate things like the Barbie movie or whatever is the outrage of the day, but simultaneously to police the speech and behavior of anybody who wants to do anything real. So we've got this weird hybrid of a political cultural class, which really retains the benefits of neither of those things. So they're not powerful enough to really achieve things for us politically, but they're also not really powerful enough for us culturally uh, to get any wins there either. So it's like, who is this really for? You know, it's trying too hard. It's like we've been saying, culture isn't something that you can just force or commission. Culture is something that people do. It's defined by what people do, and conservatives don't do anything. We have no self-understanding, no regard for an intellectual tradition. And so when we try to make something 
that is an example of right-wing art or right-wing culture typically does not go so well for us. But when the left tries to make something right-wing to mock it, it always ends up as everybody's favorite thing. Look at Rorschach. Look at Far Cry 5. Keep your rifle by your side. So we first need to understand what it means to even be right-wing, to be conservative, because without that, you're never going to make culture that reflects those things and that resonates with your people because it has no mold to be cast from. We should also know what it means to even be a person or to be alive. You know, one thing I found in the last few years is that while the left may hate nature and seek to pervert it and corrupt it, the right is afraid of nature. They have a very naive view of it in a lot of cases, and a lot of that is almost like an overcorrection for what they correctly reject from what the left is promoting. Uh, and we're going to discuss this at length very soon. We're going to do a video about why social conservatives consistently fail despite being like pretty much always correct in their conclusions, but vitality is a, an important component of this that is largely ignored, but okay, culture, it's what people do, it's what they create. The problem is conservatives don't do anything. They don't create anything. You know, they don't even exist. They don't understand what is happening around them. They have no idea what they would even want the future to look like. They can only say, well, not this. They can only define themselves by their opposition to the left. They can't stand for something. They can only express themselves and their desires in opposition to the left. They are chained to the framework of their enemy. They have no vision, they have no creativity, they have no will, no power, no viable alternative to wokeism except to just like cry about hypocrisy and continue fleecing money from their helpless but well-meaning base while they are being crushed by uh, the consequences of the incumbent political order. It's like, hey, don't, don't worry, things are fine, just keep giving us money. Look, look at what we're doing. The left does something, boom, look, South Park just owned the left, the pendulum shifts. People have had enough, woke is dead, et cetera, instead of like actually making something, making its own culture, making something real. Because to make a real counterculture, which is transgressive to the predominant one, that's pretty tough. That requires being called a lot of names, losing a lot of status that I don't think the incumbent hybrid class is really willing to sacrifice for the most part. And of course, I like to interpret pieces of existing media through a political lens, but I do that to normalize our ideas to hundreds of thousands of people in a way that is familiar to them, including the Giga Chad himself, not because I'm trying to you know, convince people that we're making inroads in the culture. And so we try to co-opt things that happen and just claim them as ours, like, uh, Nicki Minaj against the vaccines? Uh, based? Uh, Ricky Gervais made fun of snowflakes and SJWs at the award show ceremony? Uh, I think we're back. And so as it stands, the things that we try to co-opt are being perceived as victories by us simply by their virtue of not being woke. And that would be fine if it were because the right is understanding that at this point simply being normal is actually transgressive to the dysgenic, disgusting freaks that we're up against. But instead, it seems that people are just trying to sell false hope to their audiences. So right now, even the culture that's being made by us that's not explicitly right-wing or transgressive, that is a statement insofar as it's not woke. And if we had more institutional power, we could actually make things that are transgressive, which deconstruct and mock the gods of the regime, things that we mentioned earlier being equality, scientism, democracy, revolution, etc. And you do need that institutional backing because otherwise nobody's going to see it, which maybe is not important to you as an artist, but it is important to having cultural influence. And again, I have a lot of respect for artists, for storytellers. I'm not one of these people who thinks anyone can do whatever if they just put their mind to it, read enough books, work hard enough, study enough, whatever. I really do believe in talent. I believe in innate ability. And another big problem that we have is that people who tend to be conservative usually just invest their efforts into business industry, keeping the trains running on time. Like these are not people who seek revolution by nature. And so they don't tend to seek positions of power like this naturally. They think, wow, this is a pretty great system. I better, better get up and make some money. Whereas the left, they tend to be bitter and resentful by nature and they seethe because they cannot compete. And people who are like that, but who are more maybe aware of the situation politically, who are cognizant of what's going on, they usually end up getting involved in politics in some capacity, throwing their hat in the ring because they want to fight for a system and for a country that they love so much. And so that's why we have to understand the difference between the conservative artist and the artist who is conservative. You know, we don't want to put the cart before the horse here. We want excellence, we want art, and the problem is that by the nature of our current power structure, Artists are going to have to play within the lines, certain lines that are set by these people in order to gain recognition, wealth, whatever it may be. And that's really the problem that needs solving. Like we have to change those lines. We have to take control of them. We have to be the one saying, you can't get canceled for making right-wing art, but you won't be able to make a living as a left-wing artist. We'll make you radioactive. No one will touch you. No one will want to work with you. And until that changes, 
any attempt for us to really compete with this is just going to be us telling normal stories, but we're paying more for them because at least we know that the politics of the producers are more or less in alignment with ours or making a sort of, you know, right wing self parody caricature because we don't understand ourselves introspectively. We can only define ourselves by our opposition to the absurdities of the left. Whereas we could do that. We could make art that promotes our ideals, promotes what we want to be celebrated and elevated, not equality, but excellence, not scientism, but faith, not democracy, but leadership, not revolution, but civilization and so on. And a lot of great movies do exactly this. And maybe you wouldn't even think twice about it because it's just normal. And if you start associating your artwork and your culture with things that people have already been conditioned into viewing as low status or whatever, you're setting yourself up for failure. It should simply be normal. It is what it is. It's not an anti something else in branding or in purpose. It stands alone in favor of what it is saying. It believes in itself. It has the confidence to exist for its sake by itself. And I'm not trying to take, you know, the armchair approach of criticizing everyone trying to do something, people trying to do the right thing. I'm just saying, I think if we put as much effort into destroying these people's ability to artificially destroy and poison our culture as we do into making culture, things would just sort of heal themselves and correct naturally to a pretty large extent. And I completely agree. These battles need to be fought. I'm just trying to direct the energy into something that's productive, even something like, you know, preserving classic architecture like Trump was doing in DC. Even that would be doing doing more in service of our culture than a lot of things that people are trying to do now. But honestly, even if we did get this down to a T, the truth is that we could spend a year making something really cool and spend a bunch of money on it. But at the end of the day, there were probably a hundred other things that were made that were more popular and that had a bigger effect on the culture. You're not going to create a parallel Hollywood. Other countries try to do this, not even with the anti-woke niche. And they don't even come close. They're just trying in general to compete. And it still it doesn't even hold a candle. The film industry, it's globalized. And just as American culture, which it exports and imposes into the rest of the world, is totally woke and reflective of American cultural hegemony, so will Hollywood until something serious changes. Same thing with out-competing woke capitalism, starting a parallel economy. You're not going to create an anti-woke S&P 100. It's just not happening. You need to control the same forces which have forced these apolitical companies to become that way. And again, we're not being pessimistic. But to people who are overly excited and overly optimistic, a little dose of realism might seem that way. The message is simply that we have to understand the conditions we are working with. We shouldn't overthink what culture is, let alone good culture. So long as it's not deliberately subversive, degenerating, perverted, like it can probably pass the smell test, at least for the time being. But in terms of a long-term solution to these problems... You really need to keep your eye on the prize. We need political power because the separation between the state and the economy, between the state and industry, that's one of the myths of liberalism. That's never really been the case throughout history, let alone with a global empire like ours. They're not separated. They never have been, and they never will be. I mean, that'd be great. That'd be awesome if that were the case. I agree. But this is nonetheless the reality of our situation. And so long as our regime is occupied by this sentiment, our economy and our media, it's going to be as well. The debunking of that myth, that's a separate conversation, one I suppose we will have to have at some point, the right will have to have too, if we actually want to be successful. But we are up against very powerful forces. And people say that, but they don't really believe it because they act in ways which contradict that reality, which is something that we're also going to discuss pretty soon with some talk about the civil war and the collapse that we've been seeing. But the reality of our situation is that you're never going to independently create a challenge to their power because power by its nature destroys anything that threatens it, that actually poses a threat to the economic and cultural hegemony of the regime. It's going to be outright crushed or subverted, but it won't be allowed. And don't worry, there is going to be a time when that is no longer the case. I mean, these people are not competent enough to sustain their operation. But in the meantime, our efforts would be far better spent trying to accumulate and regain political power rather than just playing hot potato with people's money and telling them that it's doing something productive for them. And insofar as we are having these conversations, which is important, we should be having these conversations, but we need to direct a lot more of that focus to the elephant in the room, to what was written on the wall now almost 10 years ago, which is that Donald Trump's election and the energy surrounding that exists because he started a conversation about identity, about what it means to be an American, who we are. And that was a conversation that Americans didn't even realize that they were starving to have because they'd just taken it for granted. They didn't know that it was on the menu. The reason that we've lost our culture is because we've lost our identity. If we don't know who we are, how can we justify continuing our civilization? What civilization? What is that? What do you mean culture? What would that even be doing? What would that look like? I don't know. thought this was just the natural state of the world. I just, I took it as a given. But that's a conversation that hurts people's feelings. 
and it steps on toes because that's a conversation that draws lines. And I think that there's a very popular impulse that we see, which seeks to redirect that effort into something less polarizing, like just finding out which idea led us here, because we like good ideas and we like bad ideas. And that's important to consider because we have to be careful with our desire to intellectualize everything, because I'll give you an example. I watched the NWA movie recently, you know, the one that came out in like 2015. It's so funny how obvious everything is. Like there's this montage of them on stage rapping about drugs and killing people. And then it cuts to a scene of people like burning their CDs and they're like on the bus. Man, you speak a little truth. Everybody loses their minds. Boom. Cuts back. Drugs, killing people, sex. Then they're at a press conference and they're like, ah, ah, is a reflection of our reality. No, you idiot. No, these guys aren't making songs lamenting this behavior. Man, it sucks that my neighborhood dangerous. I guess I should have left the Democrat plantation. Like, it's all just glorifying it. It's music that is made to glorify and promote disgusting and uncivilized behavior. Just like the Maury Povich show, Jerry Springer. You know, you take behaviors and attitudes that were unheard of, that were reserved for the lowest classes of society, and you bring it into everybody's living room. And they can't help but watch because it's so bad. And you laugh at the people who protest your vulgarity and your efforts to subvert a polite and moral culture with this filth as if they're the problem. They're the ones demonstrating antisocial behavior. But it's not enough because people still eat this up. They want what's on the top shelf. The forbidden fruit. All this crap that's in our culture. You know, it's not a matter of, oh, we accepted X and that led to accepting Y. No, people in power decided that it was time for music with explicit language and murder and drugs and sex. Oh, well, music has always been about that. Not like this, actually. No, it hasn't always been like that. Maybe you listen to the lyrics of older songs, pick up on some innuendo in a lyric that's being sang, but at least I don't have to worry about my kids picking up on disgusting language because some ghetto whore has been told that she has a constitutional right to broadcast spoken word poetry about her literal asshole to the public. And this was fought in courts. The battle goes on. Eventually it's too late. People just accept it. They move on. We are obsessed with this intellectual genealogy. This led to this. And then this led to this. Like it's some puzzle that we have to solve. It's people in positions of power making decisions and us having insufficient power to stop that from happening. Not to say that's not important studying these things, but like we said before, it's not really frog in the pan where it happens slowly over time without you noticing. It's much more like frog in the blender. It just happens and you have no way of stopping it and then it's too late. You're like, I think I might be in a blender right now. Yep, darkness, it's over. But frog in the pan, that's a comforting lie because it implies an absolving of responsibility. How could we have stopped this? It was too subtle to notice, really? These drastic societal changes, which were all thoroughly protested and argued against, they were just under the radar. The problem is, like now, most people don't care enough to work against what does not immediately affect them because they take their lives uh, for granted. You know, they enjoy the day-to-day -day pleasantries and they would rather just continue that. And this is fine, it's normal, it's essentially unavoidable. But what does matter is that people who do notice these things stay focused and not be led astray by their respective distractions of the day, which for someone interested in politics might be five days spent discussing a calendar. Because at the end of the day, and you know this if you talk to people about things, nobody really supports these things. If they had a button in front of them that would just make them all go away in an instant, leaving everything else the same, they would, they would hit that button. The problem is, and this is just the way people are, most people just do not care enough to actually put in the effort to oppose these things. So we might be blackpilled when we see, oh, you know, support for gay marriage at an all-time high. No, it's not. What that means is that most people have just surrendered because the battle has been lost. Most people aren't going to actively push back against something and risk having their lives ruined by the alphabet mafia, as it's referred to, simply for voicing an opinion that was considered normal until just a few years ago. And so they prefer to just take the normie morality of, well, hey, I don't care what anybody does so long as it makes them happy and they leave me alone. So yeah, they support it, but they really just want to be left alone. And they mistakenly think that their best route to that is just surrendering the issue. And that really is one of our biggest problems. One of our biggest tasks is going to be getting people who are at their core, productive, polite people who really just want to mind their own business to realize that they are the exception now. And if they want to leave a country behind to their children and to their grandchildren, they're going to have to become impolite and imposing and channel their productivity into cleansing the rot from our society. And that all means that they're going to be called mean. That's the choice. You can have your country back or you can avoid being called mean. There's no third path. And if you can get enough people to that point, then things will look a lot better for us. And support being properly understood as just surrender, that's very important to this. But we're gonna need power to do that, specifically in institutions that work to curate the opinion of the public. Take back the universities. You wanna know something about that? I don't think the woke colleges and universities are a problem to the degree that conservatives would have you believe. They're a problem. We have to take care of that, 
But a lot of what I hear about that is coming from people who haven't been to college in decades and they see what's going on at the schools. They assume that there's a large causal link. They think they're just churning out these radical Marxists. Allow me to share some insight into what's really going on here. During my stint in higher education, I had to take one of those really woke classes. It was mandatory. It was all about race and power imbalances and the oppression of the different groups by straight white men to varying degrees throughout America's history. It's exactly what you're imagining it as in your head. And I, being a black person expert, though at the time I wasn't yet accredited, passed the class with 100%. There was not a single point available to me in this class which I did not obtain. And the reason for that is that I understand what these people think about the world at a level of fluency where I can just answer all their questions perfectly off the top of my head. And the fun part for me wasn't, you know, starting an argument, playing devil's advocate, maybe back in high school, but at this point I have nothing to prove. So. What I derived a great sense of enjoyment from was answering questions and writing essays, which if you're a liberal, you would think, oh, this is so great. This is so inclusive. But if you know me, then you're reading this and you're like, wait a minute, is he making a case for, so, you know, just things like that. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and everyone that I talked to throughout this, you know, oh, it was just an easy class, which maybe, yeah, it was, but you know, we're not solving like differential equations or anything. So it's going to be comparatively easy, but I would show my assignments and my essays to friends and family. And there was a ton of material that would be included that they weren't familiar with or they hadn't heard of. And so I realized it just sort of worked out in my favor because, you know, you drop me in like a mythology class. Okay, now I actually have to do the reading because I don't know a lot about mythology. So it just happened to work out for me because I've spent hours a day, every day for the past 10 years reading about this stuff. And so when it comes time to be evaluated like that, it's like, okay, this is the easiest thing ever. But I'll tell you this. So we had to do these group discussions where we'd say something and then we'd all respond to each other. And I went into this class, by the way, thinking like, okay, great. Another humiliation ritual. This is just going to be totally debasing, whatever. I'll get through it. What I actually saw was very white pilling. You had your typical woke MLK wannabe preacher types who were legitimately illiterate. Like I would read the things that they would write. I could understand what what they were saying, but it was not well written at all. It also wasn't what you would typically expect to, like bad writing to look like. Like it was presented very pretentiously, like it made an attempt at punctuation and structure. The best way I can describe it is if you took a rock that you found on the ground and you just polished it really hard to try to make it look cool. That was like the quality of writing from these people. But you had, of course, those kinds of kids and then a you know, handful of like white liberal types. The average kid though in the class totally disengaged from the material. The average white kid was like, well, I don't understand why people say reverse racism isn't real and I don't like being stereotyped as dumb just because I'm blonde and I'm like, wait a minute, the sun is coming out? These kids weren't buying it at all. We'd submit our final projects. They had to be a creative expression of what we had learned in the class. It was worth 500 points. The biggest assignment of the semester and this one girl wrote the stupidest poem of all time. It was like 30 words. That was her final project, 500 points. And it's not even that she's like a bad poet necessarily or whatever. She obviously just did not care about any of it. And then I'm reading the peer feedback and it's guys like, wow, Zoe, I could tell you put a lot of effort into this. This is so impactful. And I'm like, dude, no freaking way. Are we back right now? Do I CC somebody on this? Do I forward this to the we're back department? These kids just don't care. Nobody took it seriously. And so then I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, what is causing this then? What is the problem? I thought about it. Have you spoken to the average college student, let alone one who has to take classes like this? They're not retaining the information. The average IQ of a college student has been dropping. It's been dropping for a while. And resultantly, curriculums are getting dumbed down. They're getting more woke. But why is this happening? Are the woke colleges and universities really to blame? Sure, to some extent. But there's something else that we ignore. And this is something that we're going to get into in one of those videos that I mentioned earlier, you know, about the American identity, sovereignty that I mentioned in the last video. A lot of what people regard to be the woke young generation, it's really easy to view it through that lens. It's not so uncomfortable. But a lot of that woke young generation can be explained by the fact that Gen Z, Gen Alpha, these are majority minority generations of teenagers, students, most of them are non-white. And if being woke is defined in practice by, you know, supporting efforts which seek to subvert a nation that was established as an Anglo-Saxon country and culture with traditions and customs and values, which date back literally thousands of years, should it really be so surprising that as the youngest generation becomes further removed from Northwestern Europe, that the country that they want to live in and will work towards living in looks very little like Northwestern Europe? Or on that note, when you bring in millions of people from non-Western countries into Northwestern Europe, that it stops looking and functioning and feeling like Northwestern Europe? Is that surprising? You know, you look at the data, you find out that four in 10 Gen Zers say the founding fathers are better described as villains. What the heck? The, the woke kids, damn it. Okay, maybe. 
But you look at the data on this, and what you see is a single-digit percentage of white people will describe the Founding Fathers as villains, 9%. Even college-educated white women, 6%. Oh, but everything is the fault of liberal white women. Cringe, cringe, grow up. Yeah, really edgy. Whoa, whoa, you insulted liberal white women. You better not let George Soros and Klaus Schwab find out about that, or else the freaking CIA might assassinate you kill-style. You got to understand, you know, we know what's going on with the woman stuff. We get it. We discussed it at length in the last video. But it's just like denigrating Italians, French, Canadians. It's, you know, you can be edgy as, as much as you want, as long as the target is ultimately white. That's how the game is played. But anyways, 6% of college-educated white women describe the Founding Fathers as villains. Meanwhile, about 40% of black people, over a quarter uh, of Hispanics, about a third generally of all non-whites describe the Founding Fathers that way. And this is even despite the fact that those demographics are far less likely to attend the woke indoctrination camps. Wow, crazy. Crazy that the woke education seems to be the most effective in populations which have an incentive to believe it already or perhaps even a grudge against the targets of it based on envy, what their parents told them, something else. Crazy. And people struggle with this because white people mostly interact with other white people, especially about politics. And when they do talk to non-white people about politics, a lot of times it'll be at work or something and there's like a shared moment between guys laughing at a gay person or at a sexist joke or something. Maybe you get your hair cut at a black barber shop and you're like, wow, we're not so divided after all. But you remove a lot of the more absurd stuff from the conversation, start talking to people about how they actually want society to be structured, where the money goes, where the people go, you'll find that things become very different very quickly, especially when you're not in a setting like that. You know, you're just in your community and the other guy is in his community. So yeah, it's not surprising that as generations get younger, we see that they are consistently more likely to identify the founding fathers as villains, say America is an unfair society, that significant changes are needed. Various policies moving around, a number changing here, a number changing there. That's not that significant. That's how the government works. When they say significant changes, that means things like defunding the police. That means radical, woke stuff that we're seeing now. That's what they're talking about. They don't just mean like increasing entitlements by 2%, something like that. Okay, so what's the real issue here? Look at my case, for example. You could never convince me to be ashamed of my heritage. I just, I don't have that impulse in me. I took it upon myself to go the distance, do all the reading, just out of my own curiosity. When I was in school, you know, I said what I had to say to get A's, but at the same time, I never lied. Now I have that sense of pride. I also know the information to justify it. But the information was second. What came first was a fire in my belly, that spirit. I felt a sense of pride in my identity. You could never indoctrinate somebody like me. And you really can't indoctrinate someone like me, but who just never cared enough to do all the reading for himself. So he doesn't have all the real information necessarily. But at the same time, he's not buying into what they're teaching him in school. Because people who have a pride in their identity and in their heritage would never agree to its deconstruction or the deconstruction of the civilization that descends from that, which is what woke seeks to do. So the problem isn't really the information information, it's that Americans are demoralized, and we're demoralized because we know that we're an occupied nation. We haven't had our interests put first in decades. We're embarrassed on the global stage. We're sold out. It's humiliating, let alone everything that we see in the media, in advertisements, etc. And we've seen data, too, that teaching white kids that they're evil, that lowers their self-esteem. And if you don't have self-esteem, how can you believe in your own existence? How can you justify its continuation or the continuation of your culture or your country or your ways of life? It's not that they've been taught compelling information, which wins the argument to a careful mind, it's that they've demoralized generations of people who are now just limping along, waiting to be put out of their misery. These kids are already depressed, they're mentally ill, they're spiritually ill, they are sick from chemicals and endocrine disruptors, they're fat, they just want to die. They literally just want to die. In the universities, they, they hand them the tools to articulate why maybe that's not such a bad thing. And then that's why they start crying. You talk to these kids long enough about these issues, they start crying. They identify with the struggles of the lower classes of people because they themselves are struggling. They identify with narratives of victimization because they themselves are depressed. People's attitudes towards the world, towards politics, they are far more informed by what they see in the media, on social media, how all of this makes them feel than by what they're learning in schools. Notice how you've never once met a well-adjusted white liberal. They don't exist, especially the younger ones. All the well-adjusted white kids are like center-right, but they'll say they're apolitical because they don't feel like getting nagged. The reason kids become liberal is because of resentment. They resent the world around them. They resent themselves. It's all driven by resentment, obviously. All change is going to be linked to resentment since you kind of have to at least resent something a little bit if you want to work towards changing it, right? Now, imagine the amount of resentment you'd have to store within yourself, within your being, to make your entire worldview about eternal, indefinite change and revolution never satisfied. It's because these people are insatiable. They'll never be satisfied because the problem isn't with the world or with society. It's with them. 
That's why Instagram reels are doing far more to get the youth in the right direction than just urging them to read like, you know, Thomas Paine or take a free class about the constitution. These kids don't become this way because of their classes so much as they do because of their social groups, because of the media, popular culture, et cetera. And yeah, education's important. K-12, probably even more important for things like this. But you could get rid of Marxist professors in every college or university in the country, and I guarantee you things would more or less stay the same, especially five years afterwards. There would be some change, but it would not be drastic. The information is not the driving factor here. You cannot demoralize the people with data points and history and facts and logic if they are proud of themselves. Maybe over time, but certainly not within a generation or two. Imagine trying to convince black people that they shouldn't be proud of themselves. Imagine trying to teach black people that they should be ashamed of their history. That would not work. They would not believe you, no matter what you told them. We don't have high schoolers on our side you know, reading the books that they're reading because they had a base teacher or something like that. You know, we have them reading the books that they're reading because they saw uh, a little dark age edit on TikTok or iFunny or something, right? They felt proud of themselves and they followed that impulse down the rabbit hole. What good is the information by itself? In order for people to believe good things about themselves, they have to believe that they themselves are good, that they excel, that they are capable of such good things. And Americans do believe that. Americans are patriotic, very patriotic by nature. And Americans want permission to be proud of themselves. They're starving for that permission. And if we're keeping score, there's a lot to be proud of, frankly. And whoever gives them that permission to be proud of themselves is going to win. The left gives them permission to be proud of their contribution to social justice or whatever, handing away the torch of their civilization. We are too scared to give them permission to be proud of rejecting that, rejecting the idea that there was anything wrong structurally and fundamentally with our society at any point. It's like we said years ago, don't tread on me versus silence is violence. People like strength. People gravitate towards strength. Don't tread on me says, I want to be left alone. uh, So leave me alone. And if you don't, maybe something will happen. I don't know. Whereas silence is violence says, you literally have to participate enthusiastically in our cause or else you are morally transgressive. That sounds like confident messaging. That sounds like something that takes itself seriously. It doesn't care about being <laughs> smug or getting one or getting one over on the annoying coworker or the extended relative. It takes itself seriously. That's why it wins. The anti-white stuff, the anti-Western stuff, those are the tools that they have been given by society to articulate the more subconscious messaging that people feel, which is that we suck. It's not a coincidence that you cannot find a single straight white male in advertising. It's not for you. The last classically masculine pop culture icon, James Bond, kill him off, talking about replacing him with a black guy. There's an impulse of envy and erasure of white culture while simultaneously claiming that there's no such thing as white culture. But a big component, too, is removing the ability of white people to see themselves portrayed positively in any way that is separate from being subservient to a woke narrative or agenda. Captain America, he's good because he fights for gay rights, bigot, but by themselves, independently from helping the poor, oppressed people, which means paying for them to do literally whatever they want. I mean, that's how an AI would interpret this whole system. White people aren't cool. They're cringe. They're dorky. They're bland. Their music is lame, blah, blah, blah. And then then we're like, oh, okay. Because, you know, we're afraid to speak about ourselves positively. Because if we really started keeping score, that would make people uncomfortable. You know, it's not just about the information. That's important. But who is learning that information? How do they feel about themselves? Through what lens are they going to be interpreting that information? Who's it intended for? What's the purpose of it? These are the real questions. We're going to have to answer those. But I do want to go through still our year in review. 2023, the year we made culture, the year we fought woke. All right. Remember this guy? Remember Oliver Anthony? People went insane for this guy. Literally overnight, all the biggest talking heads were posting this guy. This is what making culture is. This is the way. And then it ended up not working out so well in the end. I swear to God, to this day, I have not heard the song beyond like 10 second clips. And I don't know if these people had just never heard a country song before, or maybe they're so used to listening to, you know, the uh, hypnotizing rap music or pop music that when they hear what a real voice and real performance with an instrument sounds like, they're just like, wow, we discovered fire. I don't know. Honestly, I couldn't bring myself to buy into the hype. And I remember deliberately not commenting on it at the time because it was one of those things. You know, everyone is so hot over this guy that if I say anything critical, I'm just going to get dogpiled. And that just, you know, was not worth it to me over something like this. Why are you being defeatist? We have to make culture. You're just jealous. This is what taking the culture back looks like. Look, this guy made a song, you know, let him make a song, let him cook. Stop trying to make it into this new conservative national anthem. Because that just brings it away from being culture. And maybe that's what ended up messing everything up. People expected way too much from this guy. 
But like we said, culture is an expression of the soul of the people, and the soul of conservatives is eternally smug. Oliver Anthony, he made a decent song, but more importantly, he gave people the hope that one day the libs may in fact could be owned. But you know, with most of these other examples, you know, you see conservatives, they try to make something, they try to make culture. It's a smug answer. It's made as a smug response to whatever the libs are doing. And because it's set up with that as the foundation, that's the lens through which it is viewed, conservatives aren't getting enjoyment out of it so much because of the product, but it's because of the satisfaction faction that they might actually be owning the libs upon consumption. That's what they're getting out of the product. It's consumption makes them feel smug. The final battlefield for conservatives, Christmas dinner with their SJW family member. That's what their focus is on at all times. Now, in playing the long game, telling young people to become very powerful, that would probably do a lot more for us than just telling them to go into the trades. But while they're at it, buy the base version of this cringe product at a markup from a website instead of just what you can go get at the corner store because you have to punish some random company because this diversity hire in their marketing department, they ran a stupid ad campaign. It's like, hey, I'm all for voting with your dollar, but who's really benefiting from that? It's like, okay, I guess this is how we take the culture back. I'll buy your product. I'll wait for it to come in the mail two weeks later. I'll consume your product. Okay, all right. Now what? What happens now? No, that, that was my turn. I was selling you the product. I did you and the culture a service by selling you my based product. We are taking the culture back. You have to buy our version of the product, our version of this product. That's not a parallel economy. It's a satellite. That's an island. Uh, and yeah, you know, there are examples where this works and somewhere it doesn't. I'm not describing anything in particular, it's sort of a if the shoe fits kind of scenario. But in a lot of cases that we see, it's not a parallel economy. It's just fleecing money from your audience. And I know that because virtually 100% of your marketing is done to your built-in audience. If it were parallel, we wouldn't even know who started it. It would just exist. It wouldn't be linked to some figure. You would just see it. It's like Twitter. Look at Twitter. Everyone said, fine. We're going to go start our own social media platforms because Twitter's woke. Great. You isolated yourself. You removed yourself from the conversation. You went to an island. Now that Elon Musk bought Twitter, actually managing to single-handedly recapture an institution from the left, everyone's back on Twitter because they understand that is the ideal for that type of apparatus. We need to be in the mainstream. We need to be representative. If you're trying to make mainstream products to take out woke products, it's dishonest for their selling point to just be that they're anti-woke because I'm selling them, so they're anti-woke. It's like, I'm only going to market them to you, to my audience. Like when I sell you Undertack underwear or I target training systems, I'm not telling you that that is going to take back the culture. I am telling you that it's going to make libtards get into car accidents because that's true. But it's because I need guys to stop wearing boxers that are seeping chemicals into their balls. And because I believe in marksmanship and, you know, in my experience, it's a lot easier to get a lot of the fundamentals down, just doing it at home without packing up, going to a range, whatever. These are good products. They provide a unique value. So it's not just, you know, buy this product because, well, the other product is woke. The other product is also cheaper. It's more convenient, but it's woke. So you have to give me your money because I'm not woke. It's like the same thing with the entertainment stuff. You know, it's the same problem that we have. Generally speaking, our enemies control the economic system and anything that actually poses a threat to their consolidation of economic power, that's going to be crushed. And because of that, we would be far better off telling young people to go get law degrees than we are telling them to, hey, go to trade school. And then in the meantime, make sure that you're buying our based products. And again, not throwing shade, not sniping at anybody in particular. People do this in all circles. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, a lot of times it's not. If you wanna sell a product, great. People like it, even better. But it's unfair in most cases to tell them that when you sell them this product, it's making culture, it's taking down woke capitalism because these people are typically smart enough to know that that's not actually the case. In most cases, these things shouldn't even be self-conscious about their politics or rather their simple opposition to wokeness. Like it shouldn't look like something that you would, you know, stamp your campaign logo onto and hand out at a rally or something. Movies especially. I mean, conservative movies are made to be conservative movies and leftist movies are made to be movies, but the people making them are libtards who just can't help themselves but to insert their messaging into everything. And if you're a filmmaker, if you're an artist, you will be gatekept from these positions and these kinds of opportunities if you're explicitly right wing or outspokenly so, but you can still make movies that are right wing by just making movies, which may be something to consider. Like at this point, normal movies, which are excellent, might even be a bigger cultural victory for the right than a movie with very explicit conservative political messaging, uh, which doesn't perform better than average. Just something to consider, but... We can't just make our own culture. We have to attack these people and show them that we aren't going to tolerate what they're doing anymore. We have to use some form of power to, to hurt these people. Boom, boycotts. Okay, so this year, I was told that conservatives took down Bud Light in Target. And I really don't want to be a killjoy, but the left has political prisoners right now, and our big victories are that we took down Bud Light in Target. I don't even think that's true, but if that were, 
see how that's kind of embarrassing for us to tout his victories, you know, just very easy victories to make us feel like we did something, like we actually have some kind of power. And I know that the left will publish articles saying that they're really scared of conservative boycotts and how it's influencing corporate America. The reason they do that, though, is because they need to pretend that corporate America isn't completely and totally on their side. And also so that they can continue the LARP of being these like perpetual revolutionaries against this incumbent evil handmaid's tale, Christian conservative regime. Here's the thing though, at the height of the backlash on social media, target sales were down like 5% in Q2 last year. They went back up in Q3. I think they're going to be okay. The biggest takeaway too, I guarantee you that the pride stuff will be coming back in June at target. So I wouldn't be so quick to declare that as a victory for us. Like it's gonna come back at Target, at every store. And even if it were a victory at Target, is that really what's gonna make life better for us? One retailer simply not displaying pride stuff? Well, it's about what it represents. It's about building momentum. Okay, yeah, where's the momentum then? Can we use it, please? Where is it headed? What's next? What are we doing? Taking down Bud Light? John, you're forgetting, we took down Bud Light. Okay, let's talk about that. Uh, Cause I've been hearing Bud Light used as a verb, like as a concept. Oh, well they need to get the Bud Light treatment. We need to Bud Light these guys. Is that possible? Can the Bud Light phenomenon be replicated? It's kind of a unique situation because it's one product, right? It's a light beer that already has a lot of competition. So maybe it's place at the top was never all too stable. I don't know. I liked it well enough, but I never met someone who'd swear by it. Maybe all it took was just a little push. Again, I think we're getting too cocky. Getting people to switch to a light beer, even to the extent that it was done, isn't really comparable to getting them to like cancel a whole streaming service, for example, with a, you know hundreds of other programs which they may enjoy because of one or a handful of particularly woke programs, let alone pretty much any major company like Target or whatever. So if we're recalling the Bud Light phenomenon as a display of force, as, as a way to show these companies that they better not mess with us, I think that may be too optimistic. Again, the problem with being too optimistic is that it can leave your flanks open. It leaves you unprepared. Look at it this way. Netflix put out a movie like four years ago, which essentially depicted child strippers. Conservative media launched a full-out assault, and to this day, they bring that movie up. But still, Netflix has not changed its content trajectory uh, in any meaningful way, yet any loss in market shares because of some other streaming service gaining with content that is pretty much equally woke. You know, I remember seeing headlines recently about woke Disney tanking. You look into it, they're losing revenue because they lost a license to stream some sport in India or something. And I was like, why are we pretending this is a victory? What are you even talking about? Why are you lying to people on our side about this? And even woke movies that have failed, they sucked. There was no advertising. The only reason I heard about them was from our sphere. I'd heard about them because people were talking about how they were woke and failing because of that instead of because they weren't advertised. And even then, there are plenty of movies that people watch which perhaps are less obviously woke, maybe in a way that just actually makes them more subversive, and they're doing fine. I'm not saying we shouldn't boycott, I'm not saying we shouldn't punish these companies, just saying we have to be realistic with how we go about it. I don't think Bud Light should be turned into a verb because we managed to tank the sales of a beer which was being drunk by people who were probably annoyed with the trans stuff in the first place. Did we do it or did they commit suicide? That, there's a difference. And honestly, it was much more guys just having the opportunity to call other men, call each other gay, than it was some principled stand against progressivism. Like if you had a Bud Light in your hand, ha, you're gay, what? Uh, no, no, you're gay. Like that's the kind of rhetoric too, ironically, that these conservatives are terrified of in the first place because they don't wanna be called mean by people who hate them. Again, it's an opportunity to be smug. You don't drink Bud Light, you get to be smug. That's the deal. They took Trump off the ballot in Colorado. We took Dylan Mulvaney off a beer can. Both sides are smug. I'd say it's neck and neck. Okay, well, they overturned the Trump ballot thing. So never mind. We're winning. We're up. Us status back. Culture status taken back. Please give me $30,000. Hey, guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up. Leave it a comment. Subscribe to the channel. Turn on post notifications so that you can get notified in the event that I post. That's why you missed the 2nd December upload. You weren't notified. You simply... You know, it, was a, it was a skill issue on your part, and then it was such a powerful and compelling video that big tech censored it, and so now you missed it. You'll never get to see it because you didn't have notifications turned on. Uh, and then also share the video with a friend. Um, and then if you don't do these things, then you're, well, what are you, a Bud Light enjoyer? We're gonna boycott you. I'm gonna find out who you are. You think I don't have access to that information? You think that I don't have friends who have access to that information? You think I'm not so personally offended by it that I would dedicate a significant portion of my time to simply achieving that personal sense of justice? I would. I would do those things, actually. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Poof.